welcome to Science Fiction 101, the podcast series where we explore the science fiction field from all angles, covering the past, the present, and the future. We're your hosts. He's Colin. And he's Phil. (laughs) And welcome once again. This episode, we'll be reviewing a couple of winners of Nebula Awards, and I also have a revenge quiz for Colin. Uh, But before we go into those, uh, a few follow-ups from last episode had a a few comments from listeners. Um, Emmanuel uh, tweeted, actually, after our review of Project Hail Mary and said, well, mission accomplished, I just ordered Project Hail Mary. (laughs) It's fantastic. But then four days later, he tweeted again saying... My copy of Project Hail Mary was damaged when I received it. I had to return it and now have to wait for the new one. Hashtag nerd life. So I feel your pain, Emmanuel, but uh, well, you should use the ebook. Uh, they very rarely are damaged when they arrive. Although I have had a few doff ones every now and again, but not from major publishers usually. A couple of other comments. Joe posted a comment on Facebook saying, uh, Phil, you wanted more details on the crew at the beginning of Project Hail Mary. I don't know if you remember when we were reviewing it, I was saying that we didn't really get very much about who the other members of the crew were. And they were there was a bit of a mystery about them uh, being dead and all. Sorry, spoiler alert. But <laughs> I, I, I wanted a bit more about that, especially at the beginning of the book. Um, Joe says, you wanted more details on that. It reminded me of the early scenes of the crew in the original Planet of the Apes, which is is a good point. I thought of that as well, because that's, of course, another classic situation where there is a a small crew and one of them is dead. Uh, Although I think there were, what, three, four survivors um, at the beginning of Planet of the Apes. That's the the original film, of course. Yes. Um, Joe goes on to say, we got so many details about other things in the book that I was okay without more on this, as Colin also seemed to suggest. So, um, and I thought about that and I actually posted um, in reply to Joe saying that, yeah, I think on reflection, I, I was I was expecting something which I didn't really have any right to expect. You know, I was expecting the amnesia of the central character to clear uh, to the point where he had some sort of recollection of what had happened. But he was in a coma, so he wouldn't have that. So it's not really a fault of the book. It's my, my fault for having an expectation which... Um, was unfounded in a way. Daniel contacted us to say we did a great job of critiquing the book and said that the podcast is excellent. So thank you, Daniel. I'd be very pleased if you expressed your views in a five-star review somewhere. But uh, thanks for the praise anyway. And uh, another message from our friend Seth, uh, who suggested that in response to your quizzing of me, last episode, Colin, he suggested I should hit you with some questions from University Challenge. He says, I notice those students do quite poorly with pop culture questions. So how would you feel about that? Some University Challenge questions? Yeah, let's do it. (laughs) Well, actually, I couldn't really find any that were suitable, or at least it, it was taking me so long to find decent questions that were related to science fiction. So I didn't actually do that. But instead... I found a quiz which was based on the Golant's Science Fiction Masterworks series, series of books. So I'm going to ask you some questions about those. And in the show notes, I'll put a link to the original quiz where there are some more questions, but I'll just do a few questions from this. So we'll start off with a round of missing words. Can you find, can you find a missing word in each of these titles? And I can give you a clue if you need a clue as to the author of the book, but I'll just give you the title to start with. So the first one is The Moon is a Harsh Blank. Mistress by Robert Heinlein. Correct. Question two. More than blank. Oh. Do you need a clue? Uh, Yes, please. The clue is the author is Theodore Sturgeon. More than blank. No clue on that one. Uh That one's More Than Human. Classic 1950s fix-up novel made up of three novellas. It's probably Sturgeon's best novel. Huh, I haven't read any Sturgeon yet. Oh, you must. You must. He's fantastic. We should talk about him one day on the show. The next one, fill in the blank, is The Blank of the Gods. Is that the food of the gods? It is. It is. By, By Burroughs? 
No, H.G. Wells, actually. H.G. Wells, yes. that's right. Yes, one of his lesser science fiction works, but nevertheless, it's, it's, it's there, it's in his canon. I was going to say, when I said The Blank of the Gods, I was going to uh, reinforce that it is a science fiction book, because um, I, I thought, oh, you're going to think Eric Von Daniken, Chariots of the Gods. Oh. But no. <laughs> <laughs> so you're doing quite well so far. Now we go on to Missing Authors. So I'm going to give you the title of a book, and you have to name the author. So the first one is Eon, E-O-N. Oh, is, is that Ben Bova? No. Um, I can't really think of a clue to give you. Uh, I could give you his initials if you like. No, 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 that's okay. It's Greg Bear. Yes. Just before my kids were born, Bova and Bear and Benford were touring around as the Deadly Bees, oh, doing fantastic. their follow-on series to Asimov's Robots and Empire mega series that had you know been yeah. going for decades. And yeah, the next one is Cat's Cradle. I should know this. Seth just reviews this on his Who Goes There podcast. Uh -huh. Cat's Cradle. Um, it's not C.J. Cherry, but the the name isn't coming to me. No. Perhaps if I give you some other titles of books by the same author. Uh, Slaughterhouse Five. Oh goodness! <laughs> not having enjoyed Slaughterhouse Five, I think I, I I flushed that out of my memory. I, uh -huh. I do not remember. No problem. It's Kurt Vonnegut. And interestingly, uh, you know, I have this uh, connection with the Ray Bradbury Center in Indianapolis. Also in Indianapolis, there is the Kurt Vonnegut Museum, which I haven't been to, but. Uh, I, I know about it. Let's move on to some film questions, which I should imagine you'd, you'd be very good at, being <laughs> interested in adaptations. So the first one is, uh, or the, the first set of questions is, name the director of the film versions of these books. So the first one is Dune. Who directed the film version of Dune? So you're not talking about the sci-fi series, and you're not talking about the aborted adaptation by... Jodorowsky. No. Nope. Jodorowsky. <laughs> it, David Lynch? David Lynch is correct, yes. It's it's funny because that seems a very unlikely film for him to have made in many ways. It's um, rather out of character, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The next one it might be a bit obscure because it, I, even I didn't know this one. I had to look it up. I just didn't know it, But I, although I know the film quite well. Um who directed the film version of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Oh, that one I don't know. No, nor did I. It's Garth Jennings. The next one, now you should know this because you've reviewed this in recent times. The film version of, the, the first film version of The Body Snatchers. The 1950s edition. Exactly, yeah. Believe it or not, I don't pay a lot of attention to directors, and so I I'm not sure I could name any of the directors from the four that we watched. Wow. Okay. Well, this one was Don Siegel. And finally, three books that were filmed, but under different titles. So can you name the title of the film? Now, I, I said this quiz was Phil's revenge quiz. So <laughs> the, these are a bit tough. <laughs> All right. Let's see how you go with these. So the film version of Roadside Picnic was called what? That's the Russian science fiction story yes. about the nuclear accident and the people... Oh, my goodness. <laughs> you know it. You clearly know it. Oh, goodness. It was directed by Andrei Tarkovsky. Yes. Who also made Solaris. I'm drawing a blank. Ah, it was called Stalker. Stalker. Yeah. Now, this one is a real killer of a question. I'd be amazed if you get this one. <laughs> What was the film title of the adaptation of the story The Continuous Catherine Morton Ho? <laughs> the Continuous Catherine Morton Ho. Yeah. I don't know, but I think you're going to give us another movie to look into reviewing on the podcast. You may not even have the movie on your radar at all. It's a film called Death Watch. And it was from the early 1980s. Now, I'm doing this purely from memory because I don't have this in my notes, but I from memory, I think the book was by an author called D.G. Compton, and the film, I'm pretty sure, was directed by Bertrand Tavernier, and I think it was made in the UK, but I'm very vague on it. I haven't seen it for, well, since it came out, which was 
probably 40 years ago now. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there's one for your list, Death Watch. Death and Watch. finally, now I'm more hopeful that you'll get this, what was the first film version of Flowers for Algernon called? Uh, Charlie. Correct. After the main character. Absolutely. Was it the main character or was he the mouse? No, Algernon was the mouse, wasn't he? Yes. And was it a mouse or was it a rat? I can't remember. I'm pretty sure he was a mouse. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I watched that movie and it scared the living daylights out of me. Really? Yeah. Uh, a lot of my early movie watching for science fiction and other genres as a kid was uh, afternoon movies on a, a local channel mm -hmm. broadcast on television. And, you know, at the ages of nine or ten, you don't think about uh, becoming old and having dementia. And yet this man, well, you know, was... Uh, uplifted and improved yeah and then lost it all and and you get to go there and go through that process with him and it it was like oh my goodness i can't believe that would happen to somebody i hope that doesn't happen to me yeah <sighs> yeah it's it it's the perfect tragedy that story i think both the story and the film i think the, the film and even the later remake um got the the kind of the major moves of the story quite well i thought Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the gist of it, for anyone who hasn't read it or seen it, um, in Flowers for Algernon, there's a kind of a, an experiment to improve the intelligence uh, of a mouse. And the mouse becomes super intelligent and everything seems fine. So they try out the same procedure on a human being. And this guy who's basically a, it's got very little intellectual capacity s suddenly is transformed into a genius. And just as he reaches his peak of uh, intellectual ability the mouse starts to regress and you therefore know that our central character is going to follow that same path. And it's, it's a really tragic story. Mm -hmm. um, I, I always felt sorry for the mouse though, because he was the pioneer of the treatment. <laughs> you know, there's a little, there are hints of that in the green mile by Stephen King. Really? Uh, y y yeah. Not so much the, the uplifting part, but in another dimension, I, I won't say much more so that you can read it and enjoy it someday. Okay. Okay. I have seen the film at some point in the past, but I, I've never read the uh, original story. Yeah, it's interesting because it was serialized and then adapted into the, the overall novel, The Green Mile. I must check that out one day. So I, I haven't really totted up the points very well here, Colin, but you did very well, uh, even on some of the tougher questions there. I think we, we probably tied with the, about, with the amount of answers we got correct for our respective quizzes. Uh, but but well done on that. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe we should do some more of these. Let's see what people think of this. Uh, if you'd like us to do more quizzes, please tell us. And if you want us to stop, tell us, please. <laughs> well, and if you have a quiz, tell us where we can find it. Absolutely. Uh, of course, we're too lazy to create our own quizzes, but we're very happy to adapt existing ones that we find online. <laughs> so <laughs> feel free to send us questions. Let's move on to this year's Nebula Awards. A few episodes ago, we mentioned that the shortlists were out, but now the winners have been announced. So now, Colin, I don't know whether you've got the information to hand, but um, could you tell us something about the winners of this year's Nebula Awards? Uh, I have the Nebula Awards award winners in front of me. It's a pretty diverse slate of winners across the board. Mm hmm uh, one of my personal favorites was Network Effect by Martha Wells, which is one of the Murderbot Diary novels yeah so uh and it, it was a great story i read it three four four weeks ago mm -hmm. and it has this wonderful science fiction concept about a character has a is, is a cyborg and they are able to snapshot that person's entire personality and character and intellect and create a fully electronic version and they they work together to achieve one of the goals of the story and so it's interesting because they're actually talking to one another and becoming annoyed at one another by the way they, they it does it talks to itself. Yeah. That sounds good. Uh, the others I don't have so much experience with. Although when uh, File 770 did list all of the candidates, the nominees, uh, they put links to everything. So if you go and you buy a copy from Amazon, it supports the website. And then if it's been published someplace openly, uh, you can go and read it. And so I, actually, I had read... Two Truths and a Lie by Sarah Pinkser, the best novelette, and uh, Open House on Haunted Hill by John Wiswell, which is the best short story. 
great. And uh, I've read that one as well, actually, the Wiswell story, and also um, Ray Carson's story, Badass Mums in the Zombie Apocalypse. So perhaps we could talk about those, because uh, I tend to be much more into short fiction than into longer works of fiction, simply because I'm, I'm usually juggling three or four books at a time and therefore it takes me forever to finish a novel by the time i finished it i've forgotten how it began so i'm not oh. very good with with novels but short stories i can hold the whole thing in my head you know so i'm, I'm much more in tune with short stories um what did you think of uh, open house on haunted hill which was the the winning short story by john wiswell i had a couple of thoughts one was it's it's a really sweet story mm-hmm um, uh, you know, being a dad, I'm always moved when a dad is, is part of a story and, uh, the, the idea that this house would have, would have, would have helped him with his uh, daughter because mm. they're newly, uh, with, without a mom, mm. what was moving. The, the second thought was it seemed to be a, a horrible spin on a horror novel or a horror story. Mm. And that's actually kind of in the forefront where the the house is the protagonist of the story, yeah. And it's it it's complaining about how if it would murder people, it would be stronger. <laughs> and yet, uh, given every opportunity, it doesn't. It it helps people out. It's trying to help sell itself. Yeah. Uh, it it feels embarrassed by the condition of its floorboards and and yeah. wallpaper. <laughs> It was just, it was a little out there. Yeah, I, I thought it was quite sweet, really, in that way. And it could have been um, a horror story, but I didn't really see it as a horror story, simply because the house turned out to be quite nice, or quite nice to the people in the end. Um, I, I, I suppose we should say the uh, the, the basic plot is that uh, the house is, well, it appears to be up for sale, and the real estate agent has opened up the house for people to come and have a look around, and a man and his young daughter come along and just have a look at the house. And the thing that made me chuckle is that the man turns out to be a sceptical podcaster. So not just a <laughs> podcaster who is sceptical, but somebody who has a sceptical podcast. Yes. Uh, and But his daughter, his four-year-old daughter, thinks the house is haunted. She thinks there are ghosts there, and of course he doesn't have any concept of ghosts because he literally doesn't believe in them but you're right the house is the character as introduced at the beginning of the story and the, the I, I just copied out a little bit of the text here because I, I thought this nicely summed up what i liked about the story is just a few short paragraphs here uh, there's a bit that goes the four-year-old scarcely looks at the bedroom before backing out she holds the handrail with both hands as she climbs down the stairs on quivering legs. On the third stair, she freezes entirely. Now, what I like about that, that's a very visual description. Um, and I can really see her backing out of the room and coming down the stairs in that very um, slow, quivering way. And then um, shortly after that, there's a, a paragraph that goes, Some houses give their residents visions of slaughters or trauma. 133 Poisonwood gives Daddy a swift vision of his daughter's vertigo. He doesn't know it's anyone else's insight and wouldn't believe it, but he's at the stairs in seconds. Anna holds onto his pants leg until she feels safe. So the, the, the house intervenes and is a character and even plants a vision in the man's head in order that he can then go and help the daughter. But at the same, at the same time as saying that, it's saying that the house knows that he is a sceptic and therefore won't appreciate that this vision has been planted in his head. So it's it's quite clever in that way. And I like the way the the house, which sounds like it's really evil, 133 Poisonwood, um, <laughs> turns out, I think, to be quite uh, quite a nice little house. And there's a bit that says, all, all 133 Poisonwood has is a light touch, but it knows how to use it. Haunting is an art. <laughs> that was terrific. So it's not at all science fiction, is it? It's it's a sort of a sort of a horror story, sort of a whimsical fantasy, but um, not really science fiction at all. Does does that bother you? It doesn't bother me, I have to say. No, I mean it's speculative fiction. It, yeah. it falls in that category. You know, what if? What if there were haunted houses? And then it, the, the the really interesting spin is, what what if the haunting wasn't of the malevolent type that we're so used to? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's nice to have those, those sort of twists in there. Um, many years ago, Bradbury wrote a story called The Haunting of the New, um, you, you know, suggesting that it's not just old things that can be haunted. New things can be haunted as well. So it's 
putting a twist on what we all expect of hauntings. So that's quite nice. So that's the story that won. John Wiswell, I, I didn't know much about before. I, I looked around to see what else he'd done, and apparently he's been publishing short fiction since about 2010. I don't think he's published any books as yet, so he seems to be very much a short story writer. So uh, it's nice that he's got rewarded for that, because there, there are lots of writers who... Um, well, to make a living, you really have to write books, and even then it's very difficult to make a living from writing books. Mm -hmm. um, and the the days of back in the the pulp days, people were able to make a living from short stories if they wrote enough short stories and sold them to the many many magazines that existed. They could make a living from that and then supplement it with the occasional book. Um, but these days, that's really hard to do. So, but it's nice to see a short story writer who seems to be a committed short writer uh, doing well in these awards. What about the one of the runners up was um Ray Carson's story, Badass Moms in the Zombie Apocalypse, which um it seems to me both that one and the uh, Haunted House uh, story, both of those are not only Nebula nominees, they're also Hugo and Locus Awards nominees. So, you know, they they both of them seem to ha uh, have um have wide appeal to mm -hmm. readers. Uh, what did you think of that one? So, in general, I'm a fan of of zombie fiction, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I do like a good apocalypse and, and a survival story. Yeah, I was a, a little taken aback uh, by a bunch of the language. I, I tend to be kind of mm -hmm. conservative, even though I'm a reader of Stephen King, and so I'm not mm -hmm. I'm not completely sure where that came from in the story. Mm -hmm. On my second reading, I I realized and I, I picked up on some things that I hadn't before. That I think that. This story set in a zombie apocalypse is really an allegory for uh, women's rights. Yeah, yeah. There's the discussion about wanting to have a baby, even though it wasn't the maybe the best thing for the community. Because while zombies in this story are drawn to humans, they're especially drawn to pregnant humans that have just delivered. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which kind of makes sense in a way. A women that have just delivered are not uh, going to be highly mobile, mm. <laughs> and they're mm. they're pretty vulnerable. Yeah, and so it was. It, it was an interesting twist to bring to that idea about surviving in a zombie apocalypse. Yeah, and and that's exactly what I liked about it. I'm not a great fan of zombie stories um, or zombie movies, and that's simply because I've seen too many of them. Mm. Um, I, I've always said with with zombies and with vampires, to be honest, once you've seen maybe two or three variations on a theme, there's not much more to do with it and you know I'd, I'd rather move on to something else thank you very much um and in terms of literature i i know some people will say well it's not that's not about zombies but for me the classic is i am legend which was way back in the 1950s now some people say well that's really vampires it's not zombies blah 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 yeah i don't care what you call the creatures in that that's the novel that really established the template for the modern kind of zombie stories that we're, we're surrounded by all the time. But what I liked about this one is precisely that twist on the idea. And as you say, turning it more into a feminist narrative. The, 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 the I suppose we should summarize the, the plot a little bit. Um, post apocalyptic, pregnant woman, because she is pregnant, these zombie creatures are going to target her. So she has to run away and she goes to a particular place which is used as a kind of a birthing uh, place in order to, to find safety. Um, I agree with you about the language. That did surprise me a little bit. But the reason it surprised me is because Ray Carson, as an author, is best known as a writer of young adult fiction. Um, you know, she's had a New York Times bestseller um, well, a series of books that have been bestsellers, and therefore I was expecting this to be more along those lines. But maybe this is her opportunity to break out of the YA um, straitjacket. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But um, And there's one other thing that it reminded me of quite intensely, and this is a, a very bizarre thing to say. Fairly recently in my back garden, there was a nest of blackbirds. And... <laughs> wait for it when the eggs hatched and the little baby chicks uh, emerged the nest was attacked by magpies and it was 
one of the most disturbing things I've ever seen. But reading this story about these pregnant women or women just giving birth and then being pursued by the zombies, that reminded me very much of that experience of seeing this blackbird nest being attacked by the magpies who are programmed to seek out newly born chicks. You know, that's the, that's what's in their genetic makeup. And that's what's in the genetic makeup of these zombies in this story. So it seemed a very raw and very natural kind of story situation, but very well told, very well written, I thought. Uh, when you brought up the story about birds, I thought you were going to bring up the phrase that one of the sentries used when they were leaving to go to the, the birthing place. Mm -hmm. So they, they call a, a group of zombies a murder of flesh eaters. They do. Yes, they do. You're absolutely right. And if I remember correctly, a, a murder is the name that you use to a group of crows. That's it. Yeah. A murder of crows. You're absolutely right. Yes. And maybe that's what triggered me thinking about these magpies in the first place, because they're, they're in the same family as crows, I think. Corvids. So, yeah. Um, little passage that I copied out simply because I, I thought the writing was, was quite good here. The narrator says, My labour pangs are mild at first. They're intense, sure, but it's mostly warmth and pressure, like my abdomen is hugging itself. I've got time, hours maybe, before I have to flee the enclave and get myself to the birthing hideout. In the meantime, I'm in our makeshift infirmary, trying to get water past old Eileen's tight-pressed lips because we ran out of IG and NG intubation supplies a long time ago. She reluctantly takes one sip, two... And that's all she can handle before she grunts, whips her greyed head to the side, spraying water all over the chalkboard. And I just find the descriptions are full of action. Even very small actions are very vivid actions. This is not a writer who sits and contemplates her navel. This is a writer who vividly presents the action of the story to you. And I, I love that kind of writing. So I think this is really very good. Yeah, it's an intense story for sure. There's not a lot of chance to sit down and uh, contemplate either as the, the characters or as the reader. There's one thing that these two stories have in common. Um, I, I wonder if you spotted any uh, connections between them. Well, neither one is classic science fiction as we would define it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Although I think the uh, the zombie one probably has more of the tropes of science fiction simply because of its post-apocalyptic setting. Mm -hmm. No, the thing I was thinking of is that they were both written in the present tense. And I think that lends both of them an enormous immediacy, which you don't get so much if a story is written in the past tense. Something in the past tense, by definition, has happened and it sort of feels safe. But with something written in the present tense, it's unfolding before your very eyes and you cannot know how things are going to turn out because they haven't happened yet. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I wonder, I may be completely off track here, but I wonder whether that present tense uh, is part of why these stories have been so successful on three awards ballots, basically. I don't know. It's a very filmic thing to do. Um, and indeed, that's the language of film scripts. Film scripts are, are always written in the present tense. One of the other things I liked about this story was the, the concept of the badass mom. <laughs> there are yeah. there are no men involved in the story, uh, aside from a passing mention of the person who gets the main character pregnant, yes. so that they can have their baby. That's right. And uh, you know, I've I've always thought of moms as being uh, incredibly tough, and yeah. self sufficient yeah. and supportive, uh, borne out by the moms I know in my life and and my wife. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's there's a general rule of the house, and that is you don't mess with mom. <laughs> <laughs> not not because you know she's vindictive or would take revenge but because of uh you know a respect for her strength and the support that she gives the family yeah yeah did you get any um any sort of echoes of the handmaid's tale from this because i think i did i think i think that's one of the things that i find certainly in the tv series of the handmaid's tale um Th there is this sort of strong bond between the women who are the mothers, you know, the, the ones who have actually given birth to children. And of course, our focal character is uh, a handmaid who has um, given birth to a child, which she's had to give up because of the way the terrible society is structured in that. 
No, I actually haven't read it or seen it. Ah, I gather the Hugos are very late in the year this year because of uh, the pandemic. I think they're announced in December, something like that. That's that sounds right. I've kind of left lost track of it, but it seems. Yeah, in years past, we've had the Hugos by now. Yeah, I'm sure we have. Yeah. Um, and the Locus Awards, I can't remember when they come out, but uh, I don't think they've been announced yet. So perhaps when future awards come out, we'll we'll do a little review of those as well. I'll, I'll make sure there are some links to the, the stories that we've talked about in the show notes. And of course, as Colin says, File 770 had links to, well, all of the nominees, pretty much anything that was uh, available online, they had links to. So there is a lot of good free stuff out there at the moment and I, I think we live in very interesting times that many of the uh, nominees for short stories and novelettes and novellas and that sort of thing quite often are published in online magazines and are freely available. Yeah, there's more availability of media than at any other time in the history of the world. Seems to be, yeah. Shall we move on to our quick jaunt through the past, present and future of science fiction. Yes. Under the heading of the past, uh, I went digging for an article that I'd read many years ago and I found it. I, I had it sitting in a book, um, but it, it took a bit of figuring out where it was. But once I found it, I was very pleased to find it. It's an essay from, well, 1968 is when it was written. I, I didn't read it until the probably the early 1990s, an essay by Samuel R. Delaney, the, the science fiction writer. Samuel R. Delaney is an award-winning novelist and also a critic, and he published a book called The Jewel-Hinged Jaw, Notes on the Language of Science Fiction, and it's just a collection of his essays, basically. And one of them is called About 5,750 Words, and it is for me, the most beautifully written explanation of how and why science fiction is different to any other form of literature. He basically says that it's the language that makes science fiction different from anything else. And he uses a very distinct example. He builds up a little sentence word by word and shows you how, as you're reading, the sequence of words leads your brain along a certain line of thought or a range of thoughts. And what science fiction does is that it can give you just that little twist that takes you into an unusual direction. And I can't remember the, the exact wording of the sentence, but it's something like, um, the red sun sets, the blue sun rises or something like that oh. um, and as you're reading and, and he builds it up word by word so he gives you the first word then talks about it a bit and then he adds the next word and talks about it a bit and so what he's able to do is put in that science fictional twist in the sentence now obviously in real science fiction you don't have a twist in every sentence but his thesis is that it's the very way that language is used in science fiction which distinguishes it from any other form the reason I mention it today is way back, I think, in episode one of this podcast, I said something to the effect that science fiction is subjunctive. Do you remember me saying something about that? That um, the subjunctive in, in language is where you say something which is uh, conditional, but contrary to fact. And I said, I don't know if anyone's ever said that before. Um, maybe I've just invented that as a way of characterising science fiction. Well, when I was reading Samuel Delaney's essay about 5,750 words, one of the things he says is that science fiction is subjunctive. Oh. So, <laughs> as I say, I read this decades ago, and it may be that I read it there, and it made me think, and I did sort of internalised that piece of information to the extent that I thought it was mine. <laughs> Do you know? But it was really... F amazing to see that as far back as the 1960s uh, a leading writer was aware of that subjunctive idea about science fiction so that blew my mind when i saw that the other day so uh, yeah so that's my piece from the past if anyone wants um to learn a bit about science fiction it's a really good book the jewel hinged jaw notes on the language of science fiction by samuel r delaney i don't find myself reading lots of samuel delaney except for these 
essays, which are fantastic. Well, and like you'd mentioned, they're, they're shorter pieces. They're a little easier to uh, encapsulate and get through. Yes, that's very true. Yeah. Have you got anything from the past, Colin? I have been reading some, some old favorites. Mm -hmm. So uh, Alan Dean Foster, who is known for novelizing many movies, yes. uh, wrote a book called Sentenced to Prism. Mm -hmm. And the, the science fiction premise is, what if there was life that was silicon-based instead of carbon-based? Mm -hmm. I, I guess it's not a, really a redemption story, because I do love a redemption story. Mm -hmm. But it's more a story about... Uh, learning how to be humble and not judgmental of things that are radically different from you. Right. Yeah. So I, I greatly enjoyed that. And uh, I have this, this high hope, and it's completely irrational, mm -hmm. that it will be adapted into a movie or maybe a, a short limited series. Uh, because with today's CGI technology, you could put, you could do a really good job of representing everything in the book. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it could be far more convincing than the most famous silicon-based life form, which was the um, the Horta in the Star Trek episode. Did you ever see that one? Yes. <laughs> no kill eye. <laughs> That's it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's the only silicon-based life form I can remember. No, that's that's really interesting. In fact, Alan Dean Foster was in the news uh, in recent times because he was up against. I think Disney yes. um, over the uh, royalties for many of those film novelizations that he'd done. Did you read about that? Yeah. In fact, that was one of the other earlier books that I, I've been rereading. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the advantages of growing up in the 70s is you had the ability to buy a lot of these novels when they were released. And so mm. I have a copy of the Splinter, yeah, Splinter of the Mind's Eye. Mm. Which is uh, it's one of the I think it's the earliest Star Wars novel that came out after the novelization. Yeah. It, it it has a story between Episode One and Two. Oh, excuse me, Episodes Four and Five. Yes, between <laughs> Star Wars: A New Hope and The Empire Strikes Back. Uh, so there's a romantic relationship between Luke and Leia. <laughs> so this this was a, a sequel to the first film, which was all that existed. And of course, he was expanding the story in the way that he thought was sensible and logical but turned out to be at odds with what uh, Lucas would actually do in the in the follow-up films that were made subsequently. Well, there's there's actually some discussion about that. Mm. There's a, a very badly written report, mm -hmm. novella, short short book, probably the yeah. right way to call it, yeah. that posits that Lucas actually has just been uh, spinning it up as he goes along. Mm. Mm. And this person did some incredibly detailed research which which I haven't second sourced to make sure that, that it's all correct and traceable, but showing that he actually invent, seemed to invent some of these things as he was going along. And so it's possible that Lucas provided the direction to, to Foster for mm -hmm. this book. And then when they got into the writing of The Empire Strikes Back, they added all these, these twists. Mm -hmm. Oh, three of the characters are related now. And so... <laughs> You know, good, goodbye romantic relationship with the princess and, you know, the, the big enemy is your father. Yeah. But yeah, Mr. Foster uh, was not being paid royalties for all this work. Disney said, well, we only bought the assets of Lucasfilm. We didn't buy any of the liabilities. Which is uh, a very strange way of doing business. But I guess if you're a large enough business, you can do that for a while and did. But uh, thanks to the intervention of the Science Fiction Writers Association. Yeah. Um, that's that's stopping. In fact, they're they're reaching out to a lot of authors trying to say, hey, if you have not been paid royalties from Disney or from other companies, please let us know because now is the time for us to put that stake in the ground and, and hold people responsible. He's incredibly prolific. I, I admire him as a writer, and so I, I follow him uh, on his website where he blogs about what he does just once a month. Hmm. He puts out a short two or three paragraph update. So uh, he's decided to try his hand at composing. Oh, wow. And that was after a long stint at being a um, a successful professional weightlifter, <laughs> a powerlifter, yeah. and uh, yeah, has not only done all these novelizations, but has a set of several series that were very very entertaining. I, I like them. I don't know if they were award winning or anything, but mm. uh, I read the Spell Singer books. Uh, I enjoy his African based science fiction novels. Mm -hmm. Because uh, he's also a world traveler. He l just l absolutely loves to travel and get out and see the world. And I think it helps him write better things because he has seen so many different people and heard their stories and see where they live and how they, they, uh, hmm. how they get by. 
And that seems rare in the field. Uh, maybe not so much today, but it, back in the, the golden age of science fiction, you would find so many writers who, who really just never left their New York apartments. You know, they wrote about um, intergalactic travel and interplanetary wars, and yet they never left the city block that they lived in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> what about present science fiction? Are you, are you looking at anything that's current, would you say? You know, aside from uh, these short stories which I read. Uh, not a lot. I've been doing a lot of older reading, mm-hmm. 80s, okay. 70s, and earlier. Yeah. Funnily enough, my only note here for the present was The Handmaid's Tale, season four. <laughs> <laughs> That's just, well, in in terms of um, initial airing in the US, uh, I gather that finished or f- finished very recently or is just about to finish. And here in the UK, it's just airing. So I'm a, a little hamstrung in that we don't do a ton of online streaming and the you know the, the media is so fractured nowadays. It's not like I can just you know change the channel uh, yeah. so to say and, and pick up <laughs> Apple Plus versus Disney Plus versus Paramount Plus versus Hulu and AMC. In the UK actually um, The Handmaid's Tale is shown on uh, broadcast terrestrial TV so it's not on a subscription channel it's on a mainstream channel uh, it's one of the wow. very yeah it's it's quite rare for that to happen most of the sort of prestige um, series are on netflix or amazon prime or you know one of those but um no I, I i don't know for sure but because the handmaid's tale is a hulu series i think um i don't think hulu has a service in the uk and i don't think it's affiliated to any of the services so I'm assuming that, therefore, they were open to selling it to broadcast TV. And uh, that's where we see it. Interesting. So you're saying yeah. if I can get you a long enough piece of wire, you can rebroadcast <laughs> it back to my house? Well, that would contravene all sorts of laws. So, you know, <laughs> especially the laws on how long a piece of wire can be. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, what about the future? Any, any future things that you've spotted on the horizon of science fiction? Yeah, there was an announcement just this week. The anthology series that I had looking forward to, Solos, uh, has been reviewed because some of it has come out, and apparently it's, mm. it's not as good as people were hoping. Mm. Yeah. Um, but there's a, a new anthology series that Disney Plus is going to host about Afrofuturism. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I think it's interesting in that they've chosen to do exclusively African writers talking about African science fiction. Mm-hmm. When I re- was reading Riot Baby, and I, I talked about it last month. Yeah. Um, I was struck at just how a, a different approach at science fiction it was from what I was used to. Mm-hmm. And it occurred to me that having read, despite having read stories about aliens and fairies and uh, dragons and elves, that I hadn't, th- th- reading about these other cultures, I hadn't read s- stories from actual other cultures that it currently exist. Mm. And so I'm really interesting to, interested to see what is their take, what is an African take on science fiction. So, yeah, I'm I'm interested in Afrofuturism as well, and uh, I spoke about a, an African journal last episode, and um, one of the few things that modern Star Trek has done well, and when I say modern Star Trek, I mean Star Trek of the last few years, Mm -hmm. is there was one of those short treks, which was an animated story, and that was a kind of an uh, Afrofuturist story. And I thought that was quite a nice thing to do uh, for a a, a wide audience. You know, it's not a specialist audience, particularly, that watches Star Trek spin-offs. My item for the future, I think I'm okay to talk about this now, although it might jinx it if I do, but I'll I'll do it anyway. Um, I'm taking over as general editor of a journal called The New Ray Bradbury Review, which is published by the Centre for Ray Bradbury Studies, uh, which I'm connected to. And um, I edited one issue of it about four or five years ago, and uh, now I'm taking over the general editorship, which means I'm going to be editing every issue. And we're going to turn it from a print journal, which it is currently, that you have to pay money for. Uh, we're going to turn it into an online open access journal, which will be free to read by anyone. So there will be no barriers to readership. This is partly because that's the way scholarship is going. So in the academic world, 
things are turning more towards making things freely available to readers and any costs are I don't know. Well, I don't know how things are paid for anymore. It used to be the case if you wanted to read something in an academic journal, you had to pay for the journal or go use your library, which has a subscription to the journal. Um, but the movement in recent decades has been towards making everything as free and accessible to the reader as possible. Uh, so that's what we're going to do with the journal. The journal has always been about Ray Bradbury's work and a little bit about his life. And it just has short articles, about 10,000 words each, uh, mostly written by academic people, but not in, not exclusively. We've had articles by filmmakers and all sorts of other things in there. And we're going to broaden it a little bit so it's not exclusively about Bradbury, but it also deals with things that Bradbury was interested in. So things like literacy, libraries, uh, space and freedom of the imagination. So that probably will come out next year um, hopefully in the early part of the year so that's my future bit not entirely science fiction but um, science fiction will pi will play a part well congratulations on your editorship that's a big step well thank you there's no money involved you know it's it's one of those things you you volunteer to do uh, from your spare time and then you think oh i don't actually have any spare time but i shall make time <laughs> i shall make time <laughs> Is it a particular expectation of people in academia that you do spend a certain amount of your free time encouraging you know, the publication of journals and the writing of journals and the planning of conferences and stuff? Yes, there, there generally is. Yeah, um, yeah, it, it, it is a sort of a, a thing we do for the common good. And, and we are paid for it, really, because most of us are on salaries of some kind. So there is some allowance for it in there. But... Um, what you find when you're doing something like this, you, you do mostly do it in your spare time because you've got a full time job. <laughs> so <laughs> yes, it's, it's the only time you can do it is evenings and weekends, really. Or you can squeeze little bits out first thing in the morning before you start work and that kind of thing. But uh, yeah. And of course, it, it's kind of thing it goes on your CV. So it's all um, all helping to raise your personal profile, which is what we're supposed to do. <laughs> Although I'm always perfectly fine keeping my head down and hiding, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Given the amount of time you spend on podcasts and, and making podcasts, you're, you're fairly visible. That's, that's true. But that's come from this last year, really. That's come from, um, well, I, I, I kind of sit in this same room from nine till five every day because I'm working from, from home most of the time. And in order to do my teaching from home, I've accumulated a load of equipment. And so when you're off duty, you see that equipment sitting there and you think, you know, I could make a podcast with this or I could make a YouTube <laughs> video with this. So that's what I do, you know. Um, so it's sort of hobbies that have spun off uh, from that. Plus the fact that it's been very difficult to go outside and do anything most of the last 18 months. Yeah. So you might as well have an indoor hobby. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, based on my work, uh, I either tend to write code or I use uh, the board games, the board games machines in unusual and, and not always well designed ways. Like, I designed an an acrylic catapult that fits in a mint tin. I can't even picture that. <laughs> I can I'll, picture I'll some pictures. <laughs> it's, it's a little hard to see because it's all translucent acrylic. But how do you actually make it? Uh, we uh, one of the products the company has is laser cut acrylic. Ah, uh, it okay. comes in two thicknesses, a quarter and one eighth. Yeah. And so uh, I designed it in my mind, and then I sketched it out, and then I, uh, you know, put it into the computer and made a, a cut file. And I sent the cut file, and they sent me back the the acrylic slug, and I wow. punched out all the pieces and took the rubber bands. And uh, for ammunition, I used the little game figures called meeples. <laughs> and yeah, you can shoot a meeple like fifteen or twenty feet with this three to four inch catapult. <laughs> uh, actually, in my mind. Last week, I designed a uh, a catapult, or not a catapult, a, a crossbow corresponding to go with it. So <laughs> when I get some spare time, I'll be drawing that up. And what does that fire? It, it will fire little straight acrylic pieces. Okay. Not meeples. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I'll be shooting the meeples down. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we've come to the end of our time there so let's say thanks for listening and we hope you'll join us next time we're phil nichols and colin kusky our theme tune is from purpleplanet.com 
and look for the show notes on our website. We're at 101sf.blogspot.com. And you can also find us as Science Fiction 101 on Facebook. And finally, please subscribe wherever you find us. We're on Apple Podcasts, Deezer, Google Podcasts, Listen Notes, and all sorts of other very obscure podcast places. So thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.